Welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I, uh, uh, I'm David Axelrod, the director of the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago uh, and a, a lifelong voracious obsessive consumer of polling. Uh, after my campaign days were done, I founded the nonpartisan Institute of Politics in 2013 with the mission of inspiring and empowering the next generation of leaders in politics and public service. Each year we bring hundreds of speakers to campus. We host fellows and residents, noted practitioners who conduct seminars and mentor students. We hold a wide array of civic engagement programs conceived and led by students and place hundreds of interns each year in Washington, local, state and international capitals, media outlets, think tanks, political consultancies and issue driven advocacy organizations. And uh, let me just note, we, we pay them so that if anyone is watching and is eager for free, brilliant young talent this summer, please let us know. We also host conferences like this when we feel we can add value to the national discussion. This is the second straight election in which the efficacy and accuracy of polling has been called into question. Changes in the nature of politics and how Americans communicate and receive information has complicated the mission of pollsters. The proliferation of public polling of varying quality has created a cacophony of conflicting data that has left many confused about what to believe. We'll explore these and other issues in the next two days in six sessions. In a few minutes, you'll hear from the lead pollsters for the two 2020 campaigns, John Anzalone of the Biden campaign and Tony Fabrizio of the Trump campaign. Uh, they noted to me as we were getting ready, first time in history, two Italian Americans, ch chief pollsters for the, for the two campaigns. So there's a little bit of history. They'll be joined uh, by Amy Walter of the Cook Report to talk about what went wrong uh, and what went right in polling in the 2020 election. I'll follow with a <coughs> panel on public polling with a stellar group of journalists and polling practitioners. And we'll finish the day <clears throat> with a conversation between Charlie Cook and Ann Seltzer, the outstanding pollster for the Des Moines Register, whose outlier Iowa poll late in the campaign was arrogantly dismissed as wildly inaccurate by bloviating commentators like me. She was right. We were wrong. What did she know that others did not? Tomorrow, we'll host discussions on the challenges of polling down ballot races in 2020, led by Jessica Taylor, who covers Senate and gubernatorial races for Cook. Juana Summers of NPR will lead a discussion on the polling of minority communities, and we'll close with a discussion led by Dave Wasserman of Cook on the methodological issues uh, posed by 2020. To spare you from Zoom-induced blindness or madness, we've scheduled these events over two days instead of one, and hope you'll join all of these sessions. It takes work to put a program like this together, and I want to thank Christine Hurley and the splendid staff of the IOP for their tireless efforts to make it happen. And we're thrilled to partner on this conference with our friends from the Cook Report, which has been providing penetrating in-depth coverage and analysis of national politics since 1984. Uh, and I appreciate this opportunity to introduce Cook's a tremendous national editor, Amy Walter. Amy, Amy undoubtedly is familiar to most of you. In addition to her widely read columns at Cook, she is a ubiquitous and insightful commentator on national television and is the host of a terrific podcast, Politics with Amy Walter. Before joining Cook, Amy was the political director for ABC News. Uh, I must add that Amy also was a Hall of Fame fellow at the U, U, U Chicago IOP now is a standout member of our senior advisory board for which we are very, very grateful. So without further ado, let me present my friend and colleague, Amy Walter. Thank you, David. And I too wanna to thank the IOP for this opportunity to host, co-host this conference. And I am very proud to be a member of the University of Chicago family. It's always nice to be in a part of a university to which as a student, I never would have made it through the admissions process. Thankfully, the IOP didn't ask for my SAT scores. So uh, I, I can stick on, I hope for, for now. Uh, I also wanted to give a big shout out to Christine Hurley who helped organize this very uh, impressive 
group of people that we're going to be presenting to you uh, over the course of these next two days. Um, at the Cook Political Report, um, we are also coming to you um, uh, with uh, some, as, as David pointed out, a number of panels. My colleagues, David Wasserman, who covers the House, Jessica Taylor, who covers the Senate and governors, and of course, Charlie Cook, uh, the mastermind behind the Cook Political Report, who covers presidential, national trends, basically everything that is important about politics, Charlie has been writing and involved in uh, for many, many years. And uh, as a practitioner of politics, much like David pointed out, we do uh, rely on polls a lot. The Cook Political Report uses polls as a very uh, critical tool um, in what we do in analyzing uh, these campaigns. Now, it's one tool. It's not the only tool. We, of course, we look at the campaigns, the candidate quality, the districts, the demographics of the states and those districts, as well as voting trends and behaviors that we've seen uh, looking for trends and other things in the political environment. But it's clear that many people on this call use polling for lots of different reasons. Media, of course, use them to help shape narratives about the campaigns, and those in turn shape how people uh, get engaged with those campaigns, specifically donors uh, deciding which candidates to contribute to and which ones they've uh, concluded uh, don't really have much of a chance. Um, we know that public policy people, many of whom are also on this call, use polling information to help message uh, policies uh, that they're putting forward. And um, of course, we know that uh, we have the campaigns themselves and how they use polling to figure out the strategy that they are using to win the election. And of course, also to, to message important um, uh, parts of their uh, th that strategy and, and the folks that they need to reach in a campaign. So all of us are really looking to understand then what happened in 2020, maybe even taking a quick look backwards to 2016 and apply the lessons learned from this election going forward. We know that polling is going to be around uh, in 2021 and beyond, and we would like to all be there to figuring out how to use it better and for the, those who practice it, how to uh, make polling perform better. Um, so I have the distinct pleasure to introduce our first panel. Um, two people, this is a, a perfect transition to two people who uh, were critical in this election, the chief pollsters for the campaigns of Joe Biden and Donald Trump. John Anzalone was the chief pollster for Joe Biden. Uh, Anzalone was also uh, involved in both of the campaigns for Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign. He's been involved and continues to be in his firm with numerous senators, governors, other uh, uh, elected officials, members of Congress. He also wants uh, everyone to know that he was one of the first people on the ground in Iowa in 1987 for Joe Biden. Um, hello, John Anzalone. Um, and Tony Fabrizio, who was a chief pollster for Donald Trump's campaign in 2020, he served in that same role in 2016. Tony's hat spent a long time in polling, just as John Anzalone has, working with a whole bunch of names that you would all recognize for the Senate, Governor, mm -hmm. House, et cetera. So let's start this off. I'm obviously. You all can um, jump in at any moment. I'm gonna direct a question to one of you simply because this is Zoom and nobody can tell who's looking at whom. But um, so Tony, I'm gonna start with you. And I think something that is really important for the audience to understand and appreciate is why campaigns do polling, what you do polling for, what it's used for, and how different is it than uh, what you see in the public domain? Well, uh, it's a great question, Amy. First, thank you to David and yourself and the whole team at IOP for inviting me to participate. 
and for me to learn from John Anzalone today uh, and uh, learn uh, how to uh, actually win a presidential campaign again. Um, we do polling. I look at it. I always tell clients that um, oftentimes in a poll, the least important number is the ballot number. Um, and it's all the other questions that we ask that actually are more informative because the ballot is what you're looking to actually influence. Now, in a presidential campaign, it's different than a congressional race or a gubernatorial race. I mean, both candidates at some point become known. And so the ballot actually is instructive. But there are so many other numbers in a survey. Uh, when we talked last, one of the things John and I were talking about was uh, the president's job approval number was very key because incumbents uh, oftentimes uh, get what their job approval number is. That's the leading indicator of what they're going to get. And so uh, we do it to help us craft a strategy and a path forward for the campaign. What groups do we need to focus on? What groups uh, do we need to message to? What would those messages be? What are their concerns? So that's why we do surveys. Now, the media and the public polls are done, as you said, to drive narratives. They're not done to drive strategy. They're done to drive narratives. Uh, that's why you very rarely see John or I release polls publicly. Uh, and if we do, it's done to drive a narrative. It's not done to drive the strategy. So it is a fundamentally different purpose why the surveys are done. And in fact, I would venture to guess, and I know the way John does his surveys and, and he knows the way I do mine, that we invest a lot more money in how we do our surveys methodologically than a lot of the public polls invest in how they do theirs uh, and, and making certain that we're interviewing the right people to get the right answers. Uh, and polling has become more challenging and will continue to become more challenging, but we continue to try to stay ahead of that challenge. Tony, before I get to John, just two quick things on things that you raised. The first is what you, you said, you, we invest a lot more in methodology than some of the public pollsters. So if you can, you can talk about that. And then, as you said, the goal of a campaign poll is to find those groups and those messages that work with those groups. So can you talk to us about what those were in the Trump campaign? Um, well, uh, one is a lot of the public polls are, well, I shouldn't say a lot. There are some public polls that are done by a single methodology or, 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 or a single method of collecting the data. So you will see some that are done totally by IVR. You'll see some that are done purely by online panel. Um, it is not often that you see mixed mode surveys uh, that are being reported. I think John would agree with me that the best way to do surveys these days is mixed mode surveys. And in fact, in a presidential race, one of the things that's, you know, people talk about polling being wrong. The truth of the matter is, is that became popular after 2016, but it wasn't the case in 2018. Polling was pretty well on in 2018. Again, in 2020, we have the problem, but in the runoffs in Georgia, that was not the case. The polling was pretty accurate, the aggregate of the polling. Um, so the problem was with the polling was I, in both 16 and 20, it was very difficult to get a handle on what the turnout would look like and the composition of the turnout and what it would look like. It was one of our biggest challenges. I'm sure John would tell you it was probably one of his biggest challenges because the parties have become so polarized. The composition of your sample ethnically, racially, by age, uh, by gender, by education attainment, by income, all of those things um, have an impact on, because things are so polarized on what your outcome would be depending on how they were weighted. In terms of the strategy or the groups that we focused on, we would create custom groups. Um, so we had a group that we had all the way through the campaign that I would call Trump targets. We had it in 2016. We modified it for 2020. And normally you ask a two-way uh, job approval. Do you approve or disapprove of the job the president's in a binary choice? We started in early 2017 asking it three-way. 
uh, where we'd ask a question. I approve of President Trump personally and the job and his policies. I disapprove of President Trump personally, but I approve of many of his policies. I disapprove of Trump personally and his policies. And what we found is, is that in the mid 40s, depending on where you looked, were well, always on the end, I dislike both or I disapprove both. We'd get somewhere in the high 20s, low 30s of approve both, but there'd be anywhere between 15 and 20% that were in that kind of middle group that disapprove personally, but approve of the policies. And that was the fundamental basis of the people we were going, we had to go after. I mean, the people, the 45% that were disapprove of both, they were never moving. Right. They were never moving. And the people that were approve of both, they were never moving away from us. But the fungible voters were in that 15 to 20 percent and they moved from time to time. And they and we used them as the basis to create our Trump target group. We took out hard Democrats. We took out, you know, uh, behavioral Democrats, we, you know, various things. But we had a set group for each state. And we would be able to define them by what they watched, what they looked at on the internet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we constantly tracked them uh, throughout the campaign. And that group would grow or, uh, or get smaller based on where the president's overall job approval was and where the ballot was, obviously. Right, makes a lot of sense. John, do you wanna add anything to that and also talk about the ways in which you uh, methodologically the stuff that you did uh, this year that was different maybe sure. from what you did in 2016 sure first thanks for having me and uh, david Axelrod in the university of chicago i was actually a senior in college at kalamazoo college in michigan when i first met david Axelrod. i was doing my senior project and his buddy david wilhelm said you need to go see david Axelrod, who had just started a, a media firm in chicago and so it has been a great uh, uh journey uh, with Axe uh, and uh, so appreciate his friendship. A couple of things that stood out from your question and what Tony was saying is, you know, there's certain myths about what pollsters do in the professional space of, of political campaigns. And one of the myths is that we tell what candidates what to say or we tell candidates the message. I'll never forget David Axelrod actually telling me this in his office that he would never take a candidate when they were pitching or interview who kind of needed to be told or was, or asked, hey, just tell me what to say and you know, I'll say it. Uh, he always knew that that was a red bell or a red alert that you know, this is not who I wanna be. They don't have a core, they don't have a foundation. And that I think is a, in some ways the myth about political polling that we tell people what to say. Joe Biden never did a poll before his announcement in Philadelphia. He knew exactly what he wanted to say. He knew exactly why he was in this race. And therefore, what Tony and I do, again, is kind of take the, the you know, what these candidates believe in, uh, what their vision or their agenda uh, for the American people, and we test it. And sure, certain things ra rise to the top. What I would tell people who are on this uh, uh, phone call, I often explain polling, it's an efficiency tool. Candidates can have a lot of ideas. They can want to run on a lot of things, but polling does help you see what rises to the top and resonates. And therefore, your paid communication dollars are being used in a very efficient way. Just like your targeting, we do targeting. And so we're talking to those people, as Tony said, who are fungible, who can actually move. Who are, I hate to use the word malleable because it sounds uh, you know, like we're trying, to, but you see what I'm saying. The yeah. fact is, is that pollsters are message development strategists. Uh, we're targeting strategists. Um, and we help the paid communications team. Everything that we do gets made into a TV ad, uh, gets made into a direct mail piece, gets made into a digital ad, et cetera. That's in some ways, some of the exciting things that Tony and I get to do is that we get to see our numbers, if you will, live uh, in what David Axelrod used to do in the TV ads, et cetera. Now there's more uh, things like digital. Mail is still a big part, especially of presidential campaigns, et cetera. But that's kind of what we do, which is so different, again, uh, than what the, uh, the, the media, uh, what the media firms do, or the media polling does. Um, uh, the other thing, I guess, just commenting on, on the media polls, 
Um, we, we, again, we do do different things. 90% of what we do is message development and strategy and tactics, et cetera. Uh, you know, that's very helpful. I'll, I'll say one other thing about the Biden campaign. You asked a question about what we found out and what we saw. We saw that voters just wanted a really simple thing. They just wanted to know they knew Joe Biden. They had a good feeling about Joe Biden. They kind of felt that they knew him at a different level than, you know, most uh, presidential candidates, right? He was a good person. He had empathy, he had compassion, and he had experience. But they wanted to know from our research what he wanted to do. And if you notice, this was very rare in presidential politics, especially from 16 and 12, is 90% of the ads that Joe Biden ran were positive. Very simple stuff. It was his COVID plan. It was his health care plan. It was his education plan. It was his build back better economic plan because that is what uh, voters were, were looking for and kind of thirsty for, quite frankly, especially kind of after the, the three or th uh, four years of Trump, which was, I think, even Tony will say, kind of you know, bombastic and somewhat fatiguing uh, uh, on people. Uh, one last thing, uh, and I'll, I'll take a breath here uh, on the media polls. We clearly do different things, right? And one of the things I think we should have a conversation about at, this, at some point is margins are the headlines. Joe Biden's ahead by 10, Joe Biden's ahead by two, whatever. Tony and I, we don't talk about margins. Jen O'Malley never once asked me what the margin in Michigan was. You know what she wanted to know? Where was Joe Biden in the poll? Because if we learned anything from 2016, and we should go and talk about those things that we learned uh, uh, that to help get more accurate polling, is that the you want to see where the Democrat is. And it was always important for us in the battleground states for Joe Biden to be at 49, 50, 51%, you know, in, uh, uh, at the, in the head. Didn't matter what the margin was, um, because a Democrat gets what they poll. And if you go to 538 or, or, or RCP, anyone who's looking at it, and you take a look at the average of polls in each of the states, not the margin, but where Joe, Biden, where Joe Biden's average was and where his election results were, they're almost dead even within one, one and a half percent. And so as pollsters, one of the things we learned from 16 and 18 is that we have to rethink about how we analyze. Because when Tony and I started, margins did matter. You know, I mean, it really was. It's different now, especially during the Trump era. I mean, Trump did mess with the system. We have to acknowledge that, just like we have to acknowledge that there's problems with polling that we need to fix, right? Um, and the fact is, is that, again, media firms or media outlets are never going to uh, have a headline about, you know, not the margin, but where someone is. I mean, it's just too complicated. That is not a clickbait opportunity for media firms. Anyway, right. I'll, I'll throw it back at you, Amy. Well, so let's talk about that, though, John and Tony. I want you to weigh in on this, too. But to your point, John, we noticed this, mm -hmm. right, when all is said and done after the election, that the Joe Biden number was pretty much spot on right. in many of these polls. It was the Trump number that was wrong. So how do you explain that? But you need to, you need to rethink about whether we're using the term right. Was the okay. Trump number wrong, right? It's not a matter of it being wrong. It's a matter of how you analyze. Like, you know, when we were sitting there, like my electoral map was perfect. And I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back, but I'm saying from what I saw and what I knew, we weren't at 50% in Florida. We weren't at 50% uh, in North Carolina. And you see what I'm saying? It's like, again, it's not a matter that we were wrong. If I saw my poll in North Carolina, and even say we were ahead by one, but Joe Biden was at 47%, I knew we were gonna lose. We had Cal Cunningham at 47% and up, I think a point, but we knew we were gonna lose. Why? Because the McCready special election, we saw where his vote was and he got what he pulled. He may have been a little bit ahead, but the fact is, is it wasn't at 50. Ossoff special election, right? And, and same thing in 17. You know, he may have been ahead in most of the public polls, but he was never at 50%. And again, you can see. So it's the analyzing of that. It's not that the poll was wrong. It was how you're analyzing. We can talk about the margins and where it was, a, you know, outside the margin of error and things like that. There were plenty of polls that are wrong. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that poll, polling doesn't have problems. We have real problems, but it's not necessarily correct to say that the Trump number was wrong because you have undecided, you have, you know, you have people who move at the end, et cetera, et cetera. Tony, what do you say? 
I, um, I look at it from a slightly different perspective than John does because our metric was not just the ballot. Our metric was the job approval too. It is very wow. difficult for an incumbent to, the, the correlation between job approval and ballot is well over 90%. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's very difficult for an incumbent to run significantly higher than his job approval, especially when the incumbent in most of these states, his image was uh, worse off than his challenger. And I think one of the things that's interesting is this is the first time in probably a while where you had uh, one, you know, in a presidential race at least, where you had one, uh, you had the challenger that actually wound up having a better image than the incumbent uh, in a number of the states. And so I, I think that also was a factor. But, um, you know, if the president's job approval in a binary, okay, in the binary was at 46 or 47 or 48, you knew that it was going to be very difficult. And even if you looked at the undecideds, if he was underwater with his job approval, they weren't going to break to him. I think one of the untold stories from 16 and, and 20 is, and you talked, John, you mentioned it, you said that, you know, the president had changed things and, you know, you know, kind of created a chaotic environment. One of the things I think that Donald Trump did is he certainly awakened a group of voters, okay, who may or may not have participated before, okay, A. B, uh, swung a group of voters that had previously been Democrat constituencies, and now they've become very reliably Republican, at least for him. And in two elections, it, he actually drove some level of turnout on both sides, by the way. I mean, I, I often joke that the best turnout mechanism the Biden campaign had was Donald Trump. The best turnout mechanism the Trump campaign had was Donald Trump. That was a problem. <laughs> um, and so like in states like Michigan, if you look at the exit polls, and we talked about this, you know, it went from, and it's affiliation. So, you know, it floats, we know that, but it doesn't, it doesn't change hugely. But we, affiliation uh, by the composition of who voted went from a plus nine Dem, a plus eight, a plus nine Dem in 2016 to a plus two or three Republican in 2020. And we still lost the state. We still lost the state by three points. Reason for that is independence broke against us, unlike they did in 2016. You know, Hillary Clinton, totally different candidate than Joe Biden, a whole host of reasons. Uh, in terms of the public polls, um, I think that, you know, they, to say that, I would say that the proprietary polling, John's, mine, a lot of the stuff that people never, ever see, do we have problems? Are there some of them that are wrong? Understand, 95 out of 100 polls are right, five out of 100 times they're wrong. It's just the laws of statistics. It's just the way it works. It's why there's a margin of error. It's, you know, it's why, you know, when we do these surveys, uh, we understand that there are always going to be outliers in these, okay? But consistently looking at the internal numbers, I'm sure if John and I turned over our internal numbers, they would show a real level of consistency over time. And, um, you could account for any differences in our numbers based upon how we may view what the turnout is going to look like. You know, he may have a point to two more African-American than ours. We may have a point, to, you know what I'm saying? You could account for whatever variances there are. In the media polls, um, in, in, in a number of the media polls, aside from, you know, a lot of them using single mode and not using mixed mode and all the rest of it, um, the focus on the margin, there is never any, any, the people who write the stories don't necessarily understand the polling and don't necessarily do the deep dive because everybody on the internet, on Twitter, Facebook, whatever, has become a polling expert. I can't tell you how many times my relatives, I'm sure it's happened to John, where they're asking you, oh, how's the presidential race going? And you say, oh, 
And they'll be like, oh, no, I read this poll and this poll said that. And I'm like, really, is this what you do for a living? Because I didn't know you became a pollster. When did you become a pollster? But everybody is an amateur political handicapper, thanks to the Internet, thanks to Twitter, thanks to Facebook, Instagram, all of these places. I'm sure John gets it all the time, too. But yeah. And, and Amy, I do think that I because I, I want to make I want to make sure people understand. I think there's real problems with polling. I don't think that we can put our head in the sand. We constantly have to innovate. And I think there was problems in 2020, including ours. There were states where we were way off. Um, and we can, if you want, we can go through. Yeah, let's do, why, you do know, that. Yep. You know, let's just talk about a couple of things. One thing that I think that, one is Trump. I mean, we can. Right. Let's yeah, talk about, let's, let's just, talk about how he, well, well I really I mean, want to get into that. Having I him on the ballot, that, what do you guys think that means? So I think 2022? a couple of things. One is, is that I do think Trump messes the, the process up. Um, I think that there's a universe that we will never get in a poll, okay? I think what Tony was talking about, which is modeling. I think we have a modeling problem. I don't think that this is new, for example. You know, in 2018, which was a good year for Democrats, real good year for pollsters. Pollsters felt pretty good, uh, although some of my partners will tell you that the, 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 the air was just as big. I think that the modelers told us in, uh, I know Tony was working in Florida, that we were going to get 6.9 million people, 8.3 million showed up. So we do have a modeling problem. That's not necessarily a polling problem, but we use the, the models um, um, for that. I think Trump messes with that, what Tony was saying. I mean, he gets people out that you could never have imagined. I think that you saw it in 2016. Um, now, in 16, there was a different dynamic because of you know, the Comey investigation at the end, I actually think that, again, those undecided, there were people, there were universes that moved to Trump and almost all of those moved to Trump. So, it, it, you know, again, Hillary basically got what she pulled, right? Well, um, and he had third party candidates and third party didn't candidates. have in 2020. Sure, yeah. sure. But I mean, he actually, I mean, I'm talking about the margin. He filled that yeah. margin with available voters who were undecided, it who were third party who went da 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 right? So, th so there's no doubt about that. Um, but again, Trump messes with things in, in some ways. Some ways we know, some ways we don't know. Modeling is one, he gets people out, et cetera. Um, I think that there was this, again, myth that he couldn't get any more out. I believe that he actually was really good at getting people out. I think one of the uh, uh, examples of that or proof of that is that when you had the January runoff in Georgia, guess what? There, there was you know, a lot of people who, who Trump had to be at the ticket. The cult leader had to be at the ticket. Sorry, that was a terrible term. But Trump had to be at the ticket for certain people to get out. OK, so I think he, we know that he messes with the system. Number two, my partner is going to be on Wasserman's uh, panel tomorrow. Brian Stryker, brilliant guy, uh, did an analysis, showed the correlation of COVID. We sometimes forget that we were polling during a pandemic. We were so happy in June and July, the response rates were up, et cetera. We thought that was fantastic. Well, guess what? Uh, that was also a problem. And so Brian Stryker shows that there's a correlation that if in late October, there was a high, high rate or surge of COVID in places like Wisconsin or um, uh, Iowa, guess what? You got a lot of democratic interviews and guess why? Because they stayed home and they listened to the rules and you know, stay at home policies, et cetera, et cetera. And so it actually turned out that you had a bigger miss uh, in public polling uh, and private polling if you had a high rate of COVID because you were there to get a higher response rate. So all of a sudden the, the, the response rate didn't do you any good. Where in Michigan, the, the, the numbers were actually closer than they were in 216 and there wasn't a surge during October. Thirdly, and this is important because we learned a lot about 16 about the interviews that we were getting with non-college educated voters, specifically white non-college educated voters, right? And we tried to correct for that. And I think that if we're all honest with, you, with each other, we've done a pretty good job, but we're not done correcting and getting the right type of interview. So when we went back to our 2016 data and weighted up our non-college whites, the numbers didn't change. And what we found was, we weren't necessarily getting the right type of white non-college educated because guess what? Non-college educated voters are now populated fairly heavily in the service industry, right? You could be a manager in a dentist's office or you can be a caddy operator in a um, architect's office and you could be salaried, you can make pretty good money and you act a lot like an educated voter. 
And we're not getting enough interviews from manufacturer, construction, you know, agriculture. Think of people who work with their, their hands and things like that. And so we've tried, we tried to correct for that. And we're still working on that. Again, big difference if you were hourly versus salary in a non-college educated environment. And we weren't doing a good, job, a good enough job if you were rural on the education level as well. Tony, did you want to say something before I get yeah. to my last point? Uh, no, no, go ahead. Finish your last point. No, no. No, I, I think that, you know, all of those, you know, all of those kind of, again, um, wrap up is in that we are working very hard to fix all of those, right? I mean, that, that is important to us. What Tony said, for example, in multimodal, um, you know, you have to do landlines, you have to do disproportionately sell, and you have to do some type of online. I think one of the problems with the media polling is they pick one mode, right? And unless you are a Pew or an Ipsos or a um, Gallup and have your own panels, panels are a real problem. Like panels are overused. We've done our own analysis that in some cases, you know, people who are online doing panels will take up to something like, you know, 46% of them take uh, uh, inter interviews, X number of interviews a day. I mean, the number of interviews they're taking, they're like professional interviewers. And so Tony and I, for example, have moved to what we call text to web, where your cell phone, you now have, you know, you get a link and then you go that way. We're catching a lot more voters we would never get. And guess what? They're more conservative. They're more Republican. Okay. And so we're throwing those in. So you constantly have to innovate and you're not seeing the media firms actually do that in any way. I would also say I have a real problem with, their, with the media firm's sample size and often whether they're doing registered or likely, et cetera. Again, really expensive to go and do it right. Uh, I, <laughs> you took kind of took the words right out of my mouth, John. Uh, uh, one of the things we noticed was uh, a couple of things, just to kind of elaborate a little bit more on what John was saying, is one of the things we noticed is we were having a harder time getting harder partisans. <clears throat> participate, okay? Wait, can you explain that uh, when you say harder uh, partisans? So for example, online samples, yeah. even, the best, even the best panel providers, okay? Even the best panel providers, we looked at the Republicans that participated online versus the Republicans that participated by phone versus the Republicans that participated text to web or text to sell. <laughs> Um, and there was underlying ideological differences in their opinions uh, about, you know, Republicanism, about government, but also opinions, differences about the president. So something that you think wouldn't be a big deal, but a 10 point difference in an opinion on the president, yeah. if I'm doing an online panel, can skew my results significantly. You know what I'm saying? And what John said about these panels being just wrung to death, they are. I mean, at some point, you're getting people who have seen so much information that they're no longer, even when you're giving them information, you know, they're just so uh, knowledgeable or they think they're knowledgeable already, um, or they're stopping the survey and they're going to check it online. They're Googling whatever the message is that you're testing, whatever the case may be. So you really have to be very careful about using those methodologies, but you have to use them because if you want to capture the largest spread of people, I mean, think about it. As John said, there's a big difference between uh, salaried versus hourly workers. You know, think about how many hourly workers are sitting around waiting to take a panel survey. You know what I'm saying? You know, um, or you're more likely to catch them on their cell or on their iPad or something like that where they might do it. The other thing is a lot of media outlets use as one of their modes IVR or what what you the media calls robo polling. I this is the bane of my existence. I mean, I don't know how John feels about it, but it I is, want. you know, it is. Uh, think about, I mean, think about the people who answer just landline surveys. And one of the things is, you know, they are very smart about a lot of times about how they weight their ages, because we know 
professional pollsters know that robo polls skew very old. But what they'll do is, is they'll do, and they'll just dial until they fill their 18 to 34 age quota in the survey. But when you look at the differences between people who respond by landline that are 18 to 34 versus the people who respond by cell or text to cell that are 18 to 34, you can see the differences. I mean, and so again, if you're not looking at the data and watching the changes that are occurring in these different modes, you can easily fall prey to, you know, producing surveys that just aren't reflective. And Tony, it might be worth for the audience so they understand IVRs. There is an antiquated law, very antiquated law that says you cannot crawl automated. You automate it, but you know, the, you put a headset on, you got a computer and the computer, you know, generates a phone number and makes the phone, the, the phone call for you. You can't legally do that with cell phones because back when Tony and I first had our first cell phone, we got charged for both incoming and outcoming calls. It's no longer the case, but our, literally when our phone banks do cell phones, they can't use the automated systems. They have to do them by hand. And it's incredibly uh, antiquated and they need to change that, quite yeah. frankly, without a doubt. They need, they need to change that law. One other thing that John mentioned that I know, Amy, you want to move on to another yeah. question. But no, but go ahead. I, I, think, I think the other big difference is, is that John and I do our surveys based on registered voter lists. That's where we draw our samples from. And we speak to exact voter. So, you know, we know we dial and if we want Amy Walter, if Amy Walter's not there, we know that, you know, Joe Walter or Sally Walter or whatever the next person is, we'll ask for them. And so at the end of the survey, we'll wind up with over a 90 percent plus match rate on an exact voter, which tells us a whole bunch of additional information, not the least of which is, which is vote history. Yeah, there is. I only know of one media outlet that does exact voter surveys. Can I, can I just add one other thing? And this is really yeah. important if you're polling Florida or a place like Georgia, but there's a lot of examples. If you're not phoning, but using really uh, cell in the minority community, I mean, yep. panels are not good at, for the minority community. You're not gonna hit you know, all the, the economic uh, um, uh, universes. Um, but if you're not using a bilingual phone bank to call Florida, like, which is, by the way, super expensive and cumbersome. Very much. You're not doing a really good poll in Florida. And if you're proud, you know, you know, for example, you know, this, uh, the, the Latino community has the highest percentage of cell usage only, right? Cell only. It's their only mode than any other ethnic or racial group. But it's very high within uh, African Americans as well. And so if you're not using the right methodology in the minority community, it's really hard. I mean, back in the day, and we probably should be start doing more of this. If you're in a play, if you're calling Nevada, you know, there's still a really good argument. We do it to, to do daytime phoning in Nevada, because guess what? It is a singular tourist casino industry. And so you're going to be missing a ridiculous universe yeah. of people if you're just calling at night. So yeah. again, the multimodal is where we're going. We have to be innovative. We have to stay ahead to be relevant um, in what we do. Uh, and, and there's no doubt about that, that there's problems. We have to acknowledge it. We can't like stand behind margin of error. We've got to throw everything that we can to get good interviews and to get accurate interviews to have credibility. And the final, the, but, and, Absolutely everything John said, and we're, I, I think people who do this professionally for a living um, that, you know, uh, obviously want to continue in the business and have accurate polls um, are constantly innovating and finding new ways and testing new ways to make our sampling better, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the, none of these things are cheap. And well. so- and even though the cost, you know, I remember when I first started doing this, I don't want to tell you how many years ago it was. Um, in some places, we still did door to door interviewing. Um, but um, telephone, the cost of the telephone calls was almost as much as the labor <laughs> to do the telephone calls. Now the cost of the calls is 
infinitesimal compared to the cost of the labor and cell calls are even more expensive to get done. And so, you know, when you start putting all of these mixed modes in and having to buy more expensive sample because you're not doing all the old fashioned RDD samples, it's what, it costs more and campaigns don't necessarily understand that you have to spend the money to get a better quality product. You know, the old expression, you get what you pay for. That's right. very true. That's clearly what you're doing. Um, John talked a little bit, Tony, about the role that they saw, that his firm saw COVID playing in terms of the kinds of people who are responding to polls. I'm curious how you saw the role that COVID played in the campaign. And I really do want to get to you know, just again, as you're, you guys were starting off these campaigns, you made some assumptions about <laughs> what the political environment was, what was going on around you. And sort of talk about, Tony, COVID was one of those things that as the world is changing around you and political events are happening, how you all adjusted and what you saw. Well, um, I, you know, John said before that um, our job as pollsters is not to tell a candidate what to say. That's the biggest misconception. And he's 100% right. Uh, I had a guy many years ago, uh, did a survey and one of the questions was on uh, funding for abortion, federal funding for abortion. And he looked at me and he said, so what should my position be? And I looked at him, I said, you don't have a position on federal funding for abortion? I mean, this is, you know, kind of, this is like 30 plus years ago. And when it was actually something that was, you know, hot issue. Awesome. At the time. And he, the person said to me, no, well, you know, what do you, what should my position be? And I said, you have, I mean, I'm not going to tell you what to say. And he looked at me with a straight face and he's like, well, it's really not like a life or death issue, is it? And I just looked at him. I'm like, wow. You know, I mean, so each one of us has had that example where somebody's like they're running for something and they have no idea on something that should be, you know, they should in their core, they should know where they stand. Um, but I think we would all agree that uh, and, and when John says that President Biden knew what he was going to say in his announcement speech, I think we would all agree that President Trump uh, probably was one of the more difficult people because you were never going to change his mind based on a poll ever. And um, he, you know, he believed what he believed. And I think he proved numerous times that he was willing to go against whatever the polling said to say what he was going to say. Um, as far as the COVID is concerned and the impact, um, I remember we did a series of surveys in early 2019, our first look across all the states. And we focused on 17 states, <clears throat> 10 of which we had won, seven which we felt might be opportunities. They were close like Nevada, New Hampshire, places like that, Minnesota. Um, and when we looked at those surveys in 2019, man, the world was bleak for us. Um, while voters thought that the economy was doing well, and they were optimistic, it was a macro optimism, not a micro optimism, meaning they weren't feeling it themselves. So we set out to try to make them feel it themselves and, you know, please stop talking about the stock market, talk more about individuals and wages and all that stuff. Fast forward, um, I'm back in the Oval in end of, beginning of March uh, 2020. Yeah. COVID has now broken around the world, but it really hasn't like hit America yet. Um, and I now come in with the same 17 states and the world has changed in terms of for Donald Trump significantly actually, because not only are voters still optimistic about the economy and that optimism is growing, now people, you know, a plurality or close to majority depending on the state are saying, that they're feeling the effects of the economy and that has lifted his job approval in these states. It has lifted the overall right direction, wrong track in the states. And at that point in time, we had ourselves ahead in our proprietary polling outside the margin in 278 electoral votes and certainly within range of another 40. So, you know, the world looked good, one problem. That day, was the day the president gave his first national address on COVID that night. And we all knew that those numbers would not stand. 
because COVID was going to be a problem. From that point forward, uh, the president's COVID job approval, which started out, you know, basically at a plus seven or plus eight, because it's very polarizing, so you don't get much. Uh, by the end of the campaign, his COVID job approval, depending on the state, could have been as much as minus 20. In some states, even more, his handling of COVID. Interesting point about that is that when you would ask individual job approvals, like getting tests, providing supplies, things like that, they would always run far better than the overall job approval. And we'd ask on the disapprovers, why do you disapprove? Is it his temperament and behavior or is it the policies and actions? And it would split about 40% policies and actions versus temperament and behavior. And so half of that disapproval had to do with the way he dealt with the problem from their perception, as opposed to what he was actually doing. Uh -huh. and, and it was a constant weight uh, on our ability. We could never get ahead of it because we only kind of made it worse as it went along. Whether it was masks, whether it was, you know, doing the daily briefings, which at first started off good and then kind of took a turn where even if we announced good news, we'd find a way to make bad news in that story and that would become the story. So we were never able to kind of get ahead of it. And after the first spike, when we came back with the second spike, that was really problematic, uh, the second spike, because the second spike hit states like Arizona and kind of hit our breadbasket. And in states like Arizona, you saw governors that were extraordinarily popular, like Doug Ducey, just literally dive underwater. Brian Kemp literally dive underwater because of the handling of COVID. And, you know, we certainly weren't helping, you know, the president couldn't help lift them because our job approval was already underwater in those states on handling COVID. And so it was, and in the states that we lost, the five states that we lost that we had won last time versus the five states that we won this time that we had won last time, there was a definite uh, COVID bias. And what I mean by bias, COVID was more important issue to those voters. And it polarized voters against us more in those states than in the ones that we won. And, so, and I would add to that, Tony, there's two things, Amy, that we saw that was important about COVID. One, it, well, three maybe, but it, it completely defined Donald Trump, right? It was for the first time really in his presidency, he was, he was being defined about his job performance on an issue. Right, uh, and that was uh, that was clearly a problem. <clears throat> there was two things that really hurt him. One is his strength. What I always called his oxygen was the economy, and his numbers dropped on the economy dramatically. I mean, he was Tony. You got to remember, remind me, but he was almost at sixty percent positive job rating on the economy, yeah. and then all of a sudden that was a basically a fifty-fifty proposition. Most yeah. places, depending on the state, yeah. right. Um, and so it, and so what happened during the COVID journey, especially during the surges, is, is they were intricately linked, COVID and the economy, COVID and the economy, because people understood that unless you got control of COVID, you can't get in control of the economy. And so again, Biden's, think of Biden's TV, it was always a, there was always about the COVID plan. The Build Back Better plan, but there was always a COVID plan that was connected to getting the economy uh, running. And the third thing, and I think this is really important, I'm sure you saw it in your polling, is that his numbers with seniors dropped in terms of his job, like almost 19%, 19 percentage points, I think, depending on the state, nationally, et cetera. And so you had it define his presidency, you had it um, hurt his biggest strength, which was the economy. And the universe of voters that he won by seven or eight points in, in 16, the group that was the most vulnerable um, started to move down. Now, he eventually won them by three, maybe, but he, we cut in half the margin in what he won them by, um, de again, depending on the state. And that trifecta uh, was really the, 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 the ball game. But the, you got to remember, 
It's always about who's the alternative, who is the options. And Biden did a hell of a job making sure that people understood that he had a plan, he was going to tackle it. And because he had a, a plan to tackle and fix a, a, a COVID, he'd get the economy moving again. Well, one of the ads that I thought that you guys ran that I was I, I thought was one of the best series was the ads that had basically the, that message that you can't fix the economy until you fix COVID. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, obviously I thought, you know, just looking at the numbers, that was, you know, a very... Uh, it was the right message for those people who were still concerned and linked it to the economy. What, what, talking about the economy, you're right, what you say. And in fact, we had a question, well, we had several questions on the economy, but we would always ask an, a, a, a comparative question. Uh, who do you trust more? Who did do a better job of rebuilding the economy after COVID? You know, Donald Trump or Joe Biden. And at the beginning of COVID, uh, the president had a serious double digit lead over Biden, serious double digit in basically almost every state that we looked at. By the end of the campaign, if there was a lead, it was scant. It was a couple of points. And so in the process of this, even though we were still getting some good economic news, we weren't focusing on the economy. You know what I'm saying? We were focusing on lots of other things that weren't our bread and butter. And part of that is, you know, understanding what's sexy and what's not sexy, you know, uh, and understanding the mindset of, you know, what they think people are going to respond to and not respond to. When in fact, you know, go back to 1992, it's the economy, stupid. You know, it's just really at some level, that was our bread and butter that we planned on writing to re-election before COVID and we just at some level kind of walked away from it a bit and never were able to make the case against Biden where we had more credibility walking in the door on that um, issue. Um, you all, we, we have uh, about 15 or so minutes left and I wanted to get to some questions that um, the folks who are listening at home have sent in. Um, Charles Germany from Counter uh, from Centerpoint Energy, sorry, um, raised this question. We heard a lot about this um, during the campaign um, about the so-called um, whether we want to call them shy Trump voters or Republicans who don't like polling firms. And so his question specifically was: Was there an intentional attempt by red voters to avoid so-called non-acceptable? polling firms. John, what do you think about this well, idea that they were yeah. purposely avoiding? Right. I think that, again, we put our heads in the sand if we don't acknowledge that there's a universe of voter that we don't get and that Trump being at the top of the ticket exasperates that, without a doubt. Um, again, Brian Stryker probably tomorrow will talk about this. One of the big correlations of who we, I think, miss tends to be this question about, do you trust other people? Do you trust institutions? Those, that's a universe of Trump voters that, you know, don't trust, you know, they have a low trust level of other people, of institutions, et cetera. Uh, and therefore, you know, I think that there's a universe that we're never going to get on the phone. Now, that's important. You know, maybe that will correct itself. Um, <clears throat> um, you know, maybe it won't. You know, like we shouldn't account on it. There's going to be a universe of Trump voters that may never come out for another uh, election, quite frankly. You know, modeling is, is certain a problem. But I will say this, in terms of what we do internally in a political campaign, us, not, you know, not looking at those voters is bad for the vote and the margin. I get it. They're never in the persuadable universe. So they don't, it doesn't change what we do on the message development, on the issue stuff and the policy stuff, because they're, they're, always, they're always against, you know, they're against us. And it's impossible to quantify. Maybe Tony can do it. Is it 3%? Is it 5%? I don't know what it is. Um, but we are certainly going to miss um, uh, some of those hardcore partisan people because we're in a divided uh, country like we've never been. And there is a trust problem with that universe. Tony, how did you did you have this challenge well, in the same way? And, 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 and how did you make you know, adjustments to ensure that you were getting the kinds of people in your samples? Well, we, John and I touched on it before. I mean, using uh, text to web or text to cell uh, help get more uh, hardcore partisans into the samples. But one of the things that we've looked at 
uh, you know, on and off is refusal rates by party, particularly if it's a registration state. Uh, can't do it for affiliation states as easily, but registration states. And, you know, it really varied widely. Um, I mean, oh. there was some times where we'd see a, a slightly higher refusal rate among Republicans. Sometimes we'd see it for Democrats. Uh, in fact, I don't know what the Democrat committees do, but, uh, you know, the Democrat, uh, the Republican, the NRSC and the NRCC actually require us to keep that data. So we could see if we're screening out people, where they're screening out, you know, you know, so we know if we're not getting a balanced sample or what we perceive to be a balanced sample. To talk about the shy Trump voters for a second, I know this is, you know, I don't disagree with John that there's a group of voters that may not participate in a survey, but it may, in my opinion, it's likely more because they're more difficult to reach than they necessarily don't want to express their opinions. To be honest with you, I've not found a Trump voter, a, an ardent Trump voter that isn't willing to express their opinion. I don't <laughs> I've not yet found one, but if somebody does, fine, tell me. Um, but we tested this uh, several different times. We tested it in 2016. We tested it again in 2020. And what we found in 2016, it actually was even. We asked Trump voters and we asked Clinton voters, you know, what did you proudly, would you proudly tell people who you voted for? Would you not tell people unless they asked? Or would you basically lie even if you they asked you, you wouldn't tell them who they voted for? And it was basically even. In 2020, though, it was slightly more towards Trump that more people would hide their vote than mm. Biden voters. But it wasn't like it was a 10% difference. It was a couple of points depending on the state. So if there was a bias, yeah, it was a bias towards that. But we're talking about a turnout that went from 137 million to 100, almost 160 million. So you okay. took, we, we would wonder how you were going to get 75 million people to vote. You know what I'm saying? When we only got 60 something less. I mean, think about the numbers and the magnitude of increase in turnout and trying to capture that in each of these states accurately in your polling. If it turnout increases the same on both sides of the partisan equation, that's easy. But guess what? It didn't increase equally in both sides in the state. So part of it is, like John said, getting the correct modeling or, you know, trying to have an insight into the correct modeling on how to uh, construct your sample frames. Um, one other question in here goes uh, to both of you about the modeling that is public, those on 538, The Economist, others. And this is John Austin from JAA asking, he's interested in your perspective on those forecasting sites and whether they consider them flawed, maybe fatally, or is the problem that most of us don't understand the information they present? Who wants to jump in on that? I, I, would never, I wouldn't go as far as the second, you know, I mean, that, that's, you know, the fact is, is that, you know, I'm going to, there's a couple problems. One is, is that even pollsters like Tony and I, we get into the bubbles of a campaign. We have our analytics people. We have these public polls. We have, you know, the Nate Silvers, the Harry Entons, et cetera. We got to be really careful about hurting ourselves. I mean, like, right. I mean, where, you know, people kind of go to, you know, what you're seeing and stuff like that. So a lot of us to suggest that we're not perfect and we got to fight that, you know, uh, fight the, the urge to do things like that. Listen, I think that they do really good work. Um, you, know, you know, I think that they often do a good job of explaining what they're seeing. And more often than not, they are quite frankly ahead of the trends and, you know, going back to 2012 with Nate Silver, right? I still got the Nate Silver, got it right shirt or whatever. Um, and so, you know, listen, I think that they do a good service because there's a lot of shitty public polls and they take those polls and aggravate, aggregate them and take the noise out of them, right? Um, and so if there's any service whatsoever, you know, they're, you know, trying to mitigate um, some problems, at least in the public polling. But uh, let's go to this question. And I guess this is for both of you, but John, it probably impacted you more in that, you know, when 
when your donors or folks are coming into your meetings it's saying true. things like there's an 87% chance we're going to yeah. win this date or, um, you know, why are you all talking down X, Y, Z? I just saw the, you know, model it, it, on like, X. Yeah. Listen, I spend more time and Tony does uh, when you're in a presidential campaign or a big U.S. Senator governor's race. We are now part of the comms department. Like we spend more of our time, you know, dealing with public polls, some of them good, some of them not so good, um, you know, and, and arguing why, you know, they're good or why they're not good. And, and it is, it's a brutal part uh, of, of what we do. Same thing, you know, with donors, et cetera. You have to trust your own data. When I'm doing donor presentations, we're using our own data uh, and you have to use your experience uh, and, you know, your acumen in terms of analysis. Uh, and at the end of the day, Again, it was about for us, we were Johnny OneNote on where we were in the poll. That was our benchmark. Yep. And yep. That, that held true for us in terms of making good decisions for the helping the campaigns make good decisions on resource allocations on the battleground states. I mean, General Malley was focused on 270 and she really never changed her map, right? Um, and the, the fact is, is that we use that data to make really good resource decisions um, because we were trusting our analysis based on our numbers. Right. Uh, Amy, if, if I can. Yeah, please. Um, uh, I want to go back to the previous question about Nate and Harry and 538. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, first of all, I don't necessarily agree always with their analysis. But I think that they are extraordinarily knowledgeable. And I think they look beyond the ballot numbers in their analysis of the data. And so they oftentimes can offer a much more nuanced look on the race, whether it be a state race, whether it be you know, the presidential race, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I do think that, the, as, as John said, one of the services they do do is they take a lot of the noise and the junk out of the system and try to normalize the data to give, you know, amateurs or, you know, other media types some constant look at where the races are. So, you know, I think, you know, one of the things we kid about in my firm is I always say, what's the needle say? Referring to the New York Times needle. I mean, <laughs> I don't think... I mean, I, I know that's, you know, that's uh, uh, that probably makes me a heretic to say that, but th they have been extraordinarily accurate. I mean, hours before things turn, they're turning, you know, their needle on where they think the race is going to go. Um, as far as, you know, the public polls and how much time we spend, it is it is a whole industry now. It is a cottage industry to use it, to drive headlines, to drive notoriety for yourself. And nobody looks at the quality of the polls. It's just, they report them, especially if it's a shocker poll, you know, that has, you know, Biden up 20. So there was one poll that had Biden up 15 in Wisconsin. If you would have came to John and I and said, oh, there's a poll that has Biden up 15 in Wisconsin, we would have laughed at the person that handed us that poll. Both of us knew Biden was not up 15 right. in the state of Wisconsin. But guess what? Made news. For all 24 hours, made news. And somebody got known. And so we spend an inordinate amount of time beating back those type of polls. And I really wish there was some type of clearinghouse other than 538 that just, or that media polls were required to publish all of their methodology and the full questionnaire to see how they ask their questions, where they ask their questions. Because as we all know, on this Zoom, where you ask a question could be impacted by what you asked before it. Yeah, we, I do think that the, that the most of the media polls now release their questionnaires and the cross tabs, but it is, there's so many polls out there that you're right, there's a lot that gets pushed. I just wanna to get to one last question here before we turn it over. This is from um, Glenn Fernandez from GKF Consulting. This is about a question on response rates and, and you all talked about mixed mode and how important it is to not just use phones. But talk about how, you know, as, as, as Glenn points out, there's this report recently that showed that 94% of people don't pick up the phone if they don't recognize the number. 
how does this impact your survey collection if only 6% of people are even available to pick up the phone and take the survey? Well, there was, there was a bigger problem. I mean, there's another response rate problem, which was yep. our response rates went through the roof during COVID. Right. And we oh, thought, right. wow, this is fantastic. It's like, it's like 1990 all over again, yeah. right? <laughs> and again, it's my- put up party, across the board. <laughs> yeah, and you don't know this until after the election, but that, you know, there was a problem even in the higher response rate. So, you know, so, the, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a problem both ways. Um, the, the bottom line is, is that if you go, do a good job um, in um, uh, balancing your demographics based on the voter universe, um, more often than not, we're, we're, we're dead on. Now, I do think that the response rate is, is usually based on phones, right? Um, right? And that's why the availability of doing a uh, party or multi-mode um, through a, a web-based uh, online um, is, is going to be helpful in, in increasing your accuracy. Because if you look, if you have three lines, three columns, and one is landlines, and one is cell phones, is, and one is your online, they all look different. Now, what we have a problem with in our innovation is what percentage do you do? Like we kept going, like back in the day, we do 50, 50, and now we're up to 65% sell. Well, what percentage of the text to web do you do? I mean, these are, these are real problems. Like we have a lot of things that we have to deal with in terms of trying to get accurate data to make you, Amy, you know, uh, <laughs> feel good about us. Yeah. I already feel good about you. All right. <laughs> Always. Um, Tony, you get the last word before I, we transition. I, I, I agree with John and the mixed mode. Um, you know, first of all, if you're doing a survey today and you're not doing at least 70% plus cell interviews or some form of non landline interviews, you're, you're missing the mark. I mean, just, you, you can't be doing that. Number one, number two, we're constantly, you know, shifting around on this mixed mode, especially with text to sell or text to web, as we call it, um, to figure out what is the right mix and in, in that, and that's something that's you know, we're going to learn through trial and error. And right now, uh, those three come back very different from each other. But we're looking at the whole and not the individual piece uh, of it. And so uh, this is, you know, polling is going to be around. It's not going anywhere. The question is, what is the future of it going to be? I think one of the things that's going to occur, and it's happening very slowly, is that I think more and more of the voter files are going to be are going to have email addresses on them where you're going to be able to get a broader online sample with actual voters just like we do on phones right now that's very limited and very mm -hmm. few vendors offer that where we've been pushing like data trust on the republican side to speed that process up because if we know they're a known voter it's not the same as having some somebody take it and screen in off of a panel, you know? And we know how many times they haven't likely participated before in an online service. So we're constantly pushing the envelope and trying new innovation to get ahead of, you know, where we are today to figure out how to get the best product because polling's not gonna go away. Candidates are always gonna wanna know. The media is always gonna wanna know. We're always gonna need to figure out strategy and message. Not going to. I mean, you, you ended us on the perfect note. See, optimism, but realistic optimism. We like that. We I'd like that. I'm a big optimist. Everybody uh, knows. I, Everybody knows. I, I can't, I know that. Um, so big thanks to John Anzalone, Tony Fabrizio. Um, we're going to come back in about five minutes with David Axelrod, who's going to moderate the panel of journalists and pollsters to talk about much of what we heard here about the world at public playing public polling plays in shaping campaign narratives. So thanks again to you both and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank, Thank you, Amy and University of Chicago. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, John.